In Jerry's lab, I'm working on the problem of trying to better define what habitat is for the polychaete worm Manuka speciosa. And the way that we're trying to approach this is from a hydraulic perspective. So we want to try to be able to look at the river and what's going on in the river and characterize that and then say whether that's good or bad habitat. So we're going out into the river and we're taking samples at different locations, samples to try to find the polychaete worm. And then we're also taking measures of hydraulic character and which is velocity and depth and substrate. So are we finding these worms in really fast velocities, really slow velocities, at different, what types of depths? And are we finding it on silt, on sand, on boulder? And then we take these samples back to the lab and we count them, see how many worms we find, and then see if we can find any relationships between depth, velocity, substrate, and um, number of worms. And what we also do is we take the worms and we process them to see whether they're infected with Ceratomyxa shasta. And then we can compare that infection prevalence to those indices, the velocities, depths, and substrate um, that we've characterized already and see if there's any relationships there. The Klamath River is an interesting system because Ceratomyxa shasta is uh, found in several different rivers throughout the Pacific Northwest where you don't see as high a level of infection in the salmon. And so this raises the question of what's different in the Klamath River? And one hypothesis is that the um, dams that are in place are actually changing the hydrologic cycle in the river. So they're changing the types of flow and the amounts of flow at different times during the year and that this is then affecting the parasite host dynamic. And one subsequent hypothesis is that the way in which that's affecting the parasite host dynamic is by creating more habitat for the polychaete worm. There's the potential to manipulate how much flow there is in the river, so how much water is coming out of the dams. And because of this, if we can determine um, a flow at which there's very little polychaete habitat, there's the potential to uh, affect the amount of habitat and subsequently affect the amount of parasite there is in the river, which ultimately is good for the fish. Maybe in places that the water is really slow, maybe there aren't many polychaetes, but those polychaetes are very heavily infected. And so there's the potential for them to release a lot of spores to then affect the fish. So these are all the types of relationships we're trying to look at and the questions we're trying to answer. Josh Strange of the Yurok tribe outlines his perspective on the hypothesis that removal of the four Klamath mid-basin dams will decrease C. Shasta infection. One of the main questions that we're trying to answer as researchers on the Klamath River is why has the fish disease problem gotten so bad? We know that both of the hosts of the parasites are native to the system, the polychaetes and the salmon, and the parasites themselves. So it's a matter of things getting out of balance. We've been looking to other river basins for clues, and one big clue came from the Cowlitz River in Washington, which doesn't have the water quality problems that the Klamath has, but it does have a dam and a hatchery in the same place. And this appears to be creating problems with Sea Shasta as well. We have a, a hypothesis that the dams on the Klamath River and the hatchery at Iron Gate are creating a situation where you have a concentration of both hosts in the same place. So the dams create stable habitats and planktonic food sources for the polychaetes and the hatchery concentrates adult spawners which then produce the mixospore life stage. And the dams themselves block the adults from dispersing further upstream and so you have a situation where you have a hyperinfectious zone in the upper reaches of the free-flowing mainstem Klamath River. This is also a problem for the wild fish, which are leaving the tributaries and then have to migrate through this hyperinfectious zone, and they're getting infected and dying in large numbers. In addition to the dams, another distinguishing feature of the Klamath River is the influence of conditions in the upper basin including contributions of nutrients and organic matter from the hypereutrophic Upper Klamath Lake. Dr. Mike Diaz is with Watercourse Engineering and is very knowledgeable about Klamath River hydrology and nutrient cycling. One of Dr. Diaz's current interests is flow and water quality, temperature, nutrients, organic matter, etc. in relation to the sea shasta and polychaete life cycle.
specifically exploring the colonization and growth of the Polychaete populations as they respond to water quality conditions, as well as the fate of the mixospore that infects the polychaete in the riverine environment. To determine which management actions would be the most practical for controlling ceratomyxa infections, we decided to use an epidemiological approach. And so Adam Ray is working on a life cycle model of the parasite for his PhD thesis. The idea is to try and figure out where in the life cycle we can implement management strategies to reduce the effect of this parasite on the juveniles. An epidemiological model is something we use to try and encompass the entire parasite life cycle. Uh, we can draw it out kind of like what we have here and it allows us to visualize some of the interactions between the parasite and its different hosts. Um, it's pretty commonly used especially for a lot of uh, human pathogens. Uh, it's big for malaria and right now we're looking at the uh, ceramic shasta life cycle. So in this basic life uh, epidemiological model we have um, tried to identify which of these different uh, shapes and symbols have values for them and for those that don't we try to conduct field experiments to actually get some estimates for those different values. So one of the projects I worked on was trying to relate the actinospore dose to salmon mortality. So what I did was in the field we exposed uh, salmon, juvenile salmon in the Klamath River for different lengths of time to change the amount of actinospores that the fish were exposed to. So we have a range of values for the actinospore dose and then we brought the fish back to the Fryer Salmon Disease Lab and observed them for infection and mortality. So we have a portion of those salmon that were infected and uninfected, and then those that died from the parasite infection. And then also from those we have a value, or we got an estimate of production of the mixospore stage. One of the current ideas is to try and manipulate flow somehow. And so we can look at these different parameters once we have valid estimates for them. Working on these mathematical models it requires quite a bit of calculus, um, but even though it's hard, it's worth it. Even though it may not sound like fun at first, it's, uh, it works out pretty well with the calculus. You can't really ask for a better office than this. I also feel very lucky in this lab that I've gotten to work with some really excellent people. Our lab is very diverse, and that's the way that I think science is going these days. Classical science was a bunch of microbiologists that worked together, a bunch of engineers that worked together, and you can't really do that anymore, anymore today because the complexity of questions that are being asked require that someone knows statistics and someone's an engineer and someone's a bacteriologist so that you can work together to solve these really complex questions. It's been a, a really fun place to work because uh, it's unique, at least in my experience in science, in that uh, Jerry, who obviously selects and hires everyone, seems to have this sixth sense about um, integrating people that work well together. So her group, which is fairly sizable, um, even though they all work on really different topics, often have to come together and integrate what they're researching, and they do so really well and I think that just speaks highly to Jerry's sense of um, people's personalities. She, she selects people who seem to just automatically work well together and it's nice because there's not a lot of drama and we usually can get things done pretty quickly. Jewel and I have talked about how we expect to get honorary engineering degrees out of this by the end of our projects because every day something new breaks and you have to figure out some new way of fixing mm -hmm. things. You know, the field biologist's best friends are duct tape and zip ties. <laughs> so <laughs> Michelle has developed this polychaete dance. <laughs> you know, people think we're pretty weird, but it works. It keeps us from murdering each other in the field and <laughs> it allows us to collect the data that we're out there trying to collect. Yeah. So.